production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, everyday objects come to life in a Dublin art installation. I was looking around for inspiration and boom, it was just there. The joy of the short north is reflected in a new work of public art. A rapper's poetic lyrics explore identity and perception and modernist paintings from a New Mexico artist. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Artist Matthew Moore has a way of bringing everyday objects to life. He calls his creations lightning sprites, and if you're in Dublin, Ohio, you never know when you might come across one. Let's take a look. For a, a while there, I couldn't produce anything when the pandemic hit. The art just went away. And so I was looking around uh, for inspiration and it just one morning looking at the kitchen with my cup of tea looking at out my window I was like I love these things I've had these solar powered toys for you know years now they keep going there's something just simple and lovely about the platform but what if we combine that with a, a more open-ended approach to art what if we make it a little more open for interpretation and sculpture and solar powered and kinetic and boom, it was just there. And so uh, then the journey became about how can I make something that expresses the way I'm feeling uh, about the pandemic. Here I'm drawing different possible heads for these creatures. Again, thinking about how we're uh, you know, we interact with these forms daily. The prescription pill bottle, or this is uh, the top for a, a tube that you twist and you can open. But then the pandemic sort of put us right back in that moment where these very mundane uh, tasks become much larger actions in our daily lives. And I, I just thought, you know, this is a moment that's worth considering. I actually worked with Susan Van Pelt Petrie to work on a, a series of gestures. Susan created a gesture that switches from recoil, which is what the pandemic made us all do, to reaching, reaching forward and grasping something new. When you see this, I essentially translated it into um, sketches. So here we are at reaching and it's going to go back to recoil. And so now they're being modeled by Todd Perkins, who's, uh, who's doing the engineering behind them. And, uh, you know, we're working together on these and uh, it'll be, they're going to be great. support material now. Mm -hmm. This is the part you see here. So I continued to work on them and, and then I got a call from, from David and Janet at the Dublin Arts Council saying we'd like you to do an installation for the Art and Wellness Show. They're whimsical, they're fun, um, you're curious about them when you see them. They look like uh, common objects, some parts of it, so there's a familiarity there, but there's also a, a strangeness about them, like an otherworldly. And I think that's where Matthew came up with the Sprite's idea. Lightning Sprite is essentially a moment, a flash of lightning above the clouds. It looks unearthly. It has a, a reddish glow to it. It's only there for milliseconds, but it's, you know, it's like something you've never seen before. 
and I thought about a lightning storm coming through Dublin and depositing these lightning sprites around, around the forests of Dublin, as if the lightning struck a tree and left one of these little sculptures there. If we come out together and experience art, it's a way to move through what we've been through the past year. And so we just hope that the art makes you laugh and gives you joy, and that's, that's our goal. We are at the beginning stages of technology that will enable us to explore many, many different ways of expression. And I see these sculptures as being part of that dialogue. Learn more about lightning sprites at DublinArts.org. The latest public art sculpture on High Street in the Short North Arts District was created to reflect the vibrancy of the neighborhood. Designed by Columbus artists Stephen Canetto and Judith Spader, Jubilation is a dynamic display of changing light and color suspended from the new White Castle building. Follow along as we document the origin story of this permanent piece of public art that graces the Short North. So we are here in the Short North Arts District, right at 2nd and High. A lot of folks know this intersection as where you can find North Star and where you can find uh, the White Castle, but now it is an intersection where you can find a remarkable new piece of public art. It is a work by a longtime Columbus artist who has a, a really incredible reputation here locally and is, is really the first time that this particular artist has worked in light with this way. And light is certainly a part of our life here in the short north. This piece of art in some way pays homage to that, but also the exuberance of everyone that you see here in the short north. So I'm a public artist. And the work that I love doing most is sight and gendered. For me, that means looking at the site, who's going to be experiencing it, and how do we create a piece? How does my partner Judith and I conceptualize a work that's going to resonate with the site and that's going to resonate with the public? Um, we were very interested in having this piece reflect the joy that is the short north. And I feel like this piece really reflects that because of the materials and because of the light. We're now in the fabrication stage and here we are actually creating the stainless steel structure that supports the sculpture's dichroic panels. Once those pieces are cut out and we can see sections of them, we're then welding them together. We'll sand, finish, polish, and then insert the dichroic films panels. One of the things I love about my work is the collective experience, the collaborative experience. So this project has had on it architects, engineers, lighting engineers, lighting designers, the fabricators, there'll be people who will install it. So there are about 20 people involved in this one piece. The central core, which is really going to be enlightening and jazzing it up, are LEDs, programmable RGB LEDs, red, blue, green, that will, through the computer's program, play with different compositions of color and movement.
The piece is totally different daytime than it is in the evening. So depending on when you visit the Short North, and many people visit the Short North both day and night, you can have a completely different experience in viewing the work of art. What it does is it both reflects light from the ambient light, and then as light passes through it, it's actually a different color. It acts a bit like a prism. So it's this composition of light, metal, the light playing with the dichroic, the light playing with the RGB LEDs, and the viewer as we walk in front of it, suspended 30 feet in the air. The people that are under this sculpture are going to be having a light show that's going to be rather hard to avoid. It's going to be reflecting on their phones, and they're going, what is that? And they'll be looking up because the dichroic material in this sculpture and the LED lights in it are going to be casting this rainbow of color. This is very new for us in Columbus. Um, this is a work of art that is attached to a building. Um, it is a, it's a pretty significant sculpture. It's, um, it's about 30 feet up in the air suspended. Um, it's about 25 feet uh, long. And, and unlike other works of, of public art that we have here in Columbus, which are sort of tactile, where you can touch them and you can see them right in front of your face, um, this is suspended above you. So how you view it changes depending on how you move around it. One of my objectives in life, being here as a Columbusite, having our base here, is to bring as much beauty and cultural meaning to the city as we can. We love Columbus, it's a dynamic, vibrant place today, and our contribution gives us a sense of fulfillment as citizens and as public artists in this community. I think this is going to be a fun piece. I think people will enjoy it. Our next story takes us to Tampa, Florida to see how a writer and rapper is exploring identity and self-expression in his highly crafted lyrics. You'll also learn about his journey to the United States from the West African country of Ghana. I'm not concerned with everything else while I'm doing it. It just feels very innate. But I think the, the biggest thing I can hope for is that they enjoy it. And if they don't enjoy it, at least appreciate it. Because you might not like something, but you can still respect that there's like work and effort that got put into this, you know? So I think acknowledgement maybe, but no, nothing more than that. Okay. okay. Uh, this is distorted portion of Horton. Who hears a who? Who hears is who? Who is Dr. Seuss? Simple rhymes, elementary book. I do it every time I don't feel like I gotta catch the hook. Yeah. He lost momentum when Gary has changed. That's how climatic. I think before meeting Shaw, I kind of got to like a certain limit where I was like, okay, I, I got all the, you know, all, all my basics. You know, I, I know what I'm doing. And then like when I started working with Shia, like, you know, just I started pushing myself. He started pushing me, you know, like to keep up with the caliber of lyricism that he was already at. You really see the intention and the love that he puts into his work and his performance. And then getting to know him there, you, like you still see the work and how it follows through. So there are times where he might be rapping to himself or repeating a line to get the cadence and inflection just right. He's constantly writing and rewriting and exploring different ways to approach things. And that carries over to his music. I mean, as an artist myself, I feel like I know tons and tons and tons of musicians. I know tons of artists and Shiel's craft and the the heart that he puts into his craft is definitely different from a lot of other people that I've come across. The 99 and 2000 for the cash money dropping, so I'm coming back again. I come from a, a Ghanaian household. I was born in Accra, Ghana in 1998, and I've been here since 2003. That's 17 years. I came here a week before I turned five. Then in 2004, we moved into our house, and I've been there since. My childhood was, it was a pretty, like, pedestrian childhood, <laughs> you know? Um, I'm pretty sheltered, so 
a lot of my time was spent within my neighborhood. You know, my next door neighbors and I, like they're African too, so we just kind of grew up in that, that same sheltered lifestyle of this is where we are. If we're not here, we're at school. If we're not at school, we're at church. Performing, I would say, started when I was like, maybe like three, four, because I was that kid at that party on the dance floor from the moment the party starts to the ending of it. So I would say I attribute my, my stage performance and presence to those early days, just the innate nature of a person. You hear music, put on a show. My writing days probably go all the way back to like first grade, but sixth grade, I would say that's when that writing translated from more formal styles of writing to more like poetic and creative forms of writing where I'm no longer writing in complete sentences. I'm writing and making up my own language essentially out of the English language and just having fun and going crazy. I don't think the writing and performing have anything to do with each other. I think the performing is just embedded in who I am as a person and the writing is something completely separate. Watching Shiel from a stranger's point of view, he can seem like a very standoffish person. And then he gets on stage and he just explodes and you're like, where did this come from? This quiet guy who's not speaking to anybody? Arm and hammer smooth, like hammers baggy loose. Pants and lateral shuffle stance. Shoulder roll with that roll on on. We took a chance and danced cause E equaled MC. Previous to MC, perceived the square. I, I do a bulk end. of the behind the scenes work. So, you know, I mix and master the music, record him, make a lot of the, uh, the beats, do all of the music videos. I do all of the technical things to get everything out of his head into the, you know, t make it tangible. My friend Scorpio is very talented. Um, <laughs> he's, he's a very diverse, diversely talented individual. So it makes me not want to just wake up and not give my best effort. Because you have somebody who's literally just like a one-stop shop for, for creative collaboration. And I have a lot of ideas, but I don't have the patience to learn the technical side of it. With Charles, I think Charles just holds me accountable. And I, I'll say with Charles, he's very outspoken about how good my art is. And I would be a fool to just wake up and stop making art and you have this person that's shouting your name at the top of the mountains. There's definitely something incredibly special about Shiel. He has a quality to him. He has a flair to him that you won't find anywhere else. Watching PBS after school while my parents were gone. We all know how hip hop is portrayed on, in the media and in different outlets. So I think the fear of my parents thinking that I'm going to dive into this art form and change the way I behave as a human being is probably what allowed me to get to the root of the art form that I actually enjoy, which is the writing and the ability to bend words and get really creative. It wasn't easy, but I think I'm finally at a point where I can create hip hop and not worry about it not being like a stereotypical type of hip hop and it just being my own brand of hip hop. Like Mr. Benjamin, tie the knife for in. Lucky Thomas Jefferson, tuck this on my wallet stands. Misfortune lingers inside of all them crevices. Crinkle cotton fibers of them Hamilton invest. It's a work in progress, but it's a movement that won't be stopped. We didn't know a uh, cryptic gang. The art keeps me centered, it keeps me grounded, it keeps me focused. It just doesn't allow my mind to, to wander and, and stay idle. It allows me to have purpose in everything I do just because I know at the end of it, the art will probably help somebody else. One of New Mexico's most renowned and influential painters, Raymond Johnson, pursued a lifelong investigation into making color and form expressive of the human spirit. Matthew Rowe, a contemporary artist, sees poignant and tremendous achievements in Johnson's paintings after 1960. Here's more. It's a lot of fun kind of decoding works, and, and Johnson just kind of takes you out on this. I don't know, when I look at them, it's like they just make my eyes feel fun. Raymond Johnson really is my favorite painter.
these late period pieces are really a question to me. We're looking at him at the apex of his spiritual expression. And we're looking at him as a mature adult who's refined his techniques. He's no longer really experimenting with the technical aspect of art, but really, what can he say? We look at this and Raymond Johnson has just gone through a tragedy in his life. His wife has passed away. And instead of responding in this negative, dark way, he's really celebrating her life and life in general. I mean, this color palette is, is looking upward. It's looking into the skies of New Mexico and it's expressing something different. It's, it's no longer tethered to the earth. And we're really moving into a different spiritual expression and a different dialogue with spirituality. He is exploring the boundaries of the canvas more. He has fully lifted the curtains. And now the works move off the canvas. It's off the picture plane. As the viewer, when I approach one of these, I'm immediately wondering where does this line finish? Where is the conclusion of this shape? How does this color fade resolve itself? And within the picture, it's complete. It gives you everything that you need to feel uh, a, a sense of finality in the work. But it also then asks you that question of, well, what, what's going on over here? So in that, the, the conversation has shifted. He's zoomed in, but by zooming in, he's allowing us to ask, what else is there? And I do love that it just challenges people's preconceptions of what New Mexican art can be and what it was. And like these pieces are contemporaneous with all the cowboy and Indian stuff. And this is as much New Mexican art as anything else. He really never stopped making art. And in that, these pieces are beautiful and they're, they're a beautiful culmination and kind of conclusion for his career as an artist. But what he left us in that is the ability to look a little further. It's the question of why. I feel Raymond Johnson really still has a lot to teach us. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Broad and High. You can find all our stories online at WOSU.org as well as on our free WOSU mobile app. We'll be back next week with more great stories about Columbus arts and artists. Out on the battle line or in the motorcade Across the table where the deal is being made Oh, oh, they got the look the look that petrifies, the look that gets its way The look that says it when there's nothing left to say Oh, they got the look After the victory After the speech gets made I still remember that look All my excuses and
Amanda Bettine, horticulture designer, Franklin Park Conservatory. I get inspiration from everything around me. It's an exciting process that's different each time I go to work on a new garden. The long-term beauty of a garden is a result of many hands. It's a collaborative force between the designer, the horticulturists who care for it, and Mother Nature. It leads to surprising and exciting results I couldn't have created on my own. Gardens continually grow and change with the seasons, so it ultimately takes on a life of its own. I think Columbus knows how to nurture relationships and let them grow. I am Amanda Bettine. Plants are my art, and there's no place I'd rather be in. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you 